Um, well, I'm excited to welcome Tom and Cree. Uh, Cree is Tom's partner, wife, uh, uh, co-conspirator, fellow traveler, and photographer, a fabulous photographer. So, but uh, on to Tom. Uh, the, in the introduction that I sent out to you like five times, Tom's an editorial and commercial photographer based in Colorado. Um, National Geographic Adventure listed him as one of 50 America's top visionaries for his photography, and he's a member of the SanDisk Extreme Team. He's an instructor at Kelby One, a frequent speaker for Nikon and Photo District News, labeled, labeled him as one of the best photo workshop instructors in the country. And I can attest to that because I've gone to his workshops for over 10 years. So um, he's written three books on photography, including adventure sports, creating dramatic Im images in wild places. And I don't see the third one. His images and stories are published worldwide by a variety of clients. And if you go to his workshop website, uh, you'll see that he's been doing workshops um, online, like most photographers who've lost their income because of they can't travel. So, and he's got a bunch of them coming up, macro and Photoshop, bird photography, Adobe portfolio, creative cram camera craft, all about speed lights, which I took a couple of months ago from him. And then he's going to get on the road in 21, uh, doing South Texas birds, Northern Lights, Tucson, uh, Costa Rica, Utah, and Yellowstone. So welcome, Tom and Cree. And I assume, Tom, you're going to be doing all the talking. So I'll shut up and let you take over. Thanks for coming. Yeah, <clears throat> no, yeah thanks for having me, guys. And, and I will just uh, say the same thing. How great to see a big group of photographers. I mean, what a great way to start 21. It is just so nice to, I mean, we all live in the Zoom world now, right? Isn't it? I mean, I love what you said, though. I have done more uh, presentations than I have in my entire career in the last six months and they've all been like this and it's just been fabulous I mean it's been you know it's not what we, maybe we envisioned in this day and age but zoom is working out and it's a great way to connect and just you know see what everybody's up to and um, I just, I would just reiterate I'm super excited to be here Roberta knows me she knows all my stories um, I so I, I, I have a big presentation for you guys tonight. I'm like, you know, what's going on? Monday Night Football, no, they already watched, you know, Baker doing his thing. They're past that. They can like focus for, for maybe 45 or 50 minutes here. Um, so I have, a, I have a big show for you guys tonight and I'll tell you right up front, um, everything that I'm gonna show you really is just uh, food for thought, trying to give you guys ideas, inspiration, maybe new ways of doing things in a photographic sense. And it's not overly gear oriented or technical. Um, there are some aspects to that, but uh, I, I just really, I am super excited to, to do this. Um, I've, we've been teaching, I say we a lot because as Roberta mentioned, uh, my wife Cree, she and I are kind of a, a, we're a two front package here. If you ever see us on a workshop, you'll see more what that dynamic's all about. But um, in a real quick nutshell, and before I start the keynote here, um, you know, I've been I've been a full time photographer for over 30 years. I, I didn't have any other job. I worked at Sears when I was 16 in Kansas City. That's kind of it. Um, I went from there into journalism school, and then I had this whirlwind adventure in photography. And um, you'll see through the show, uh, I. I since day one, I've always taught as well. You'll see that kind of come out a little bit too. I got involved in outdoor sports and in education and hand in hand was this interest in photography, but also in teaching. So hopefully some of that will come out. And I really, uh, I like doing shows like this because I like to see shows like this. Um, I am always excited to go to a presentation, whoever it is, really whatever the topic is, because um, I've definitely learned through the years that you really, you never do stop learning. And just when you think you have something figured out photographically, you learn something else. And it may be a completely different topic or style, uh, but it all kind of comes together in the big creative picture here. So my goal tonight is, I know you guys have a ton of experience out there. This is a fantastic club. I got to tell you guys, you, I'm, I'm looking at my Zoom and it's like this giant chessboard of like, you know, 60 people. You guys have 
a very active club, which is so, so great. When I lived in Alaska, they have a very tight knit photo community up there and Anchorage would have groups of like a hundred or more um, get together, especially in the winter when it's dark all the time. And I, I miss that actually in Colorado. We don't have quite as much of that going on here. So it's terrific to see um, you guys. And I, I hope tonight you, you learn a few things and, and maybe get some new ideas. So I think with that, I'm gonna jump into this just because I have a lot to go through. If you have a question, I would say maybe hold on to it until the end, just because there's so many of us and I, you kind of know how it goes with muting and unmuting and trying to figure out who's speaking. So um, I'll do my best. I have a clock here. I'll keep a, uh, a watch on the time, but I'm gonna go ahead and just screen share and I'm gonna jump right into this keynote. So here we go. <clears throat> Let's. And if you aren't seeing what I am seeing, then uh, please say something or unmute. Donna, I'm just going to stare at you and I'm going to pick up any visual cues off of you. If something is going south or just like do a hand signal. Um, Roberta can tell you, I get pretty fired up when I start speaking and I'm just like a freight train moving forward here. So, um, you know, I know the title of this talk tonight was 15 ways or tips or techniques to improve your photography. That's just kind of a teaser to get you in here. Um, we do a class right now online and it's part of what we do in the field when we're doing a normal workshop um, called Creative Camera Craft. And really what that's about is it's, it's all things creativity. And so I'm going to start a little bit with some broader topics and ideas and, and maybe give you some food for thought on your own work and where you want to go. Now, I don't know if Roberta told you this or if Donna mentioned this, but um, you get homework tonight. Um, we have homework for everybody. So that's just part of us, you know, teaching and uh, Kareen and I do this when we're on a workshop, certainly online. And of course, this is, you know, think of it more as a self-assignment and maybe something that you had never done before that you might want to try. And all this is just to help you do things differently, maybe grow creatively, um, be a better photographer. I mean, that's probably why you guys are all here tonight. It's like, how, you know, what's this guy going to tell me? He likes adventure sports. I don't hang off cliffs and do that kind of stuff. That's not me. Well, hold that thought. So um, this is who I am. And, you know, if you ask me what my photography is any, any day now, it's, I'm a generalist. And initially my career began in adventure sports. That was my break. I, 30 years ago, I was the guy fresh out of journalism school, living in the back of his truck, literally dirt bag climbers. There's a saying in the, in the, you know, that climbing community, you're a dirt bag when you're kind of living in the truck and, you know, have nothing to eat or drink, but life is still good. Um, but I was, back then it was a fringe thing. And I was photographing right out of school and companies like Patagonia and the North Face and Nat Geo Adventure and all these people, those things were just barely on the horizon back then. They were still kind of, oh, it's that cool Patagonia company, but what, don't they make climbing gear? And actually they kind of were originally more about climbing gear and with a few jackets that went with it. And so for me, my big break in the shortest description I can give you is one day I'm living in the back of my truck in Alaska. The next day, I'm getting sent around the globe by Nat Geo and Patagonia and North Face. And it really wasn't about my photo skill at all. It was more about, oh, here's this climbing guide that actually can carry a camera. So we know he can at least get out there where the cool people are doing all the cool climbing things. So if he can just aim in the right direction and get a picture, then we're going to hire that guy. And so that was my break. I mean, there was no one else. There were very few people back then. Of course, this is way back in the film days, <clears throat> FM guys are Nikon shooters. That was my kind of my starting camera back in the day. Um, but now that has, I've gone full circle with that. And a lot of what I want to bring out tonight is kind of where I went and, and how, what you might get from that. Um, it's, it's not really, I don't really want to talk about me. It's really what I learned and maybe you can learn from that. So that's, that's really what the gist of this is. You can see a little cross section of the, the kind of work that we do. Um, it's a lot. I mean, we shoot a lot of editorial, a lot of commercial, a lot of advertising. And then we have this whole workshop component too, which we absolutely love. In fact, we, Kree and I, I think we enjoy the teaching elements as much, if not more so than really assignments anymore. And that's, that's a scary thing to say when, you, you know, you're telling a client that and you're like, they're going to go elsewhere. And that's all right. 
anyway, um, here's some tear sheets, just ma magazines, different ads, things that we've done. Some of them are more recent, some of them are not. You may recognize, um, I think the SanDisk ad was running in OP not that long ago. Um, but this is what it looked like for me back in the day. Um, go to the Himalayas, run around in the Nepal and all these places, try to climb these big mountains. Gotta love the hairdo, you know, the stylistic choices here. But really, it was photography, but it was more about just enduring the elements and surviving. It's like, oh my gosh, where are we going? Uh, two months, I'm going to be climbing on this mountain. This was this peak was a, a mountain that had never been climbed by Americans before, or this route hadn't. And it's, it's almost 26,000 feet. It's a really tall mountain. Months over there, ran into snow leopards. I mean, I have so many stories. I'm going to keep moving though. I want to stay on track here because I want to get to the stuff that I, I think you guys will enjoy and maybe get something from. Um, a day in the life, you can see it's, we're all over the map doing different things, um, doing uh, still shoot adventure sports, not expeditions off to nowhere for months at a time. It's, you know, we have kids and, and all that kind of stuff. So we, you know, my lifestyle has changed, but I, I'm, you know, I'm happy with that. I don't need to live my truck anymore. Um, I, I'd rather live in, you know, the hotel on that shoot, please. Um, so anyway, and you can see now one thing that that I think I can offer you guys is um, I love portraits. Um, I love travel. I love wildlife. We shoot all sorts of macro. I mean, we do a bunch here. And so one of the things that I'm going to encourage you guys to do tonight is everyone has their comfort zone and, and what they do well. It's like, yeah, I, I get this. I'm a great architectural photographer or um, people are my thing. And I, I feel good with that. And, and, and that's great. I mean, we all have things that we're good at, but it's those other things that might make us grow a little more creatively. And if I'm going to try to throw out some ideas that maybe are not things you've considered doing, but I know have helped me get to be this, a better photographer. So let's, 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 you know, think about that and address that topic. So you'll see, um, I'm way into lighting too. Lighting has been a, a real benchmark to my career and you'll see a little bit more of that come out um, as, as we move forward, but I'll, I'll keep going. So before we even jump into kind of those 15 rules and a little more tangible, do this, get better picture idea. Um, I just want to jump back really quick into, I think we take for granted um, what photography is. Oh, I got my camera, I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna shoot some photos. I mean, I know I do this. And sometimes I have to kind of like remind myself what I heard in journalism school 35 years ago, um, the, what the power of photography is. I, I think sometimes, uh, we take it for granted or we just forget about really the medium that we use and what's unique about it. And the reason that that matters is when you kind of reconnect with that, you're like, yeah, let me try to use this aspect of, or that. Um, hands down, I am not a video guy, by the way. And I, you know, I think video and cinematography and directing and things like that are absolutely fascinating to me. Um, but for me, um, call it old school, um, I live and breathe on the still photo. That is me to a T. Um, when we do big commercial shoots, um, we hire out other people to do the video. We are the still people. We don't hybrid in on a shoot um, and do that kind of thing. It's We're about stills. And it's that ability to freeze a moment in time and the power that that can bring, how it can change um, so much if it's a well done photograph and it could be a journalistic type image or maybe it's a landscape there's just um it's fascinating to me but i think a lot of people just start to forget about that yeah okay whatever but remember that is something that you can tap into to to get that one moment that is that's what's unique about photography it depends on light let's not forget nothing happens in the photographic world unless there's light you're saying yeah i get that well, so I hear that and I say, well, how do I control the light? That's how I, that's how my career has been. It's always been asking questions. It's like, yeah, it's about, it's, I've heard that a hundred times. Well, so then the next question for me is I want to control the light. How's that speed light work? How can I light this entire room or that entire mountainside or that entire formation in Monument Valley? I want the whole thing to glow. I don't care if it's you know, it's a half mile wide, there must be a way to light it. So these are these ideas get me excited. And I'm like, let's go give it a shot. I mean, photography is about light. So now another thing that's curious is when you get into composition for us as photographers, 
we are we have existing things in the frame we're not sitting there looking at a black canvas and just going like this saying i'm going to create these ideas in my head and i'm going to paint them onto the 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 paper the canvas whatever it may be for us they're there so we have to arrange them find a perspective use some camera craft or technique that's our art that these are the things that allow us to be different to make the unique image to get the response from say the judges on a photo contest or the editor at a magazine um, this is what we're tapping into and we want to evoke a response right that's so much what it, we don't want the sleeper image we want we want something else so let's just keep rolling here um, slice of time you know some of this is pretty easy to put a finger on i'm out there i'm photographing eagles in alaska or maybe it's deer in your local park and you just get that one moment and you hit the shutter and if you do it right you get an image that will be with you forever and ever and ever. You can't go back in time, but you can hold on to that one piece of it. So, um, so interesting. But then for me, one of the, the things that just gets me so wild and crazy about photography is, okay, I'm going to go shoot birds in Alaska for a month, but then I'm going to come home and I'm going to try this project where everything I shoot is a second and I'm shaking at the camera. I'm going to go abstract. Um, it's such a different direction than the wildlife shot and now I'm going after the abstract shot but to me that is very interesting and you know I've often told people I think I have like ADD when it comes to uh, photography I'm just everything is interesting to me food photography it all is interesting now from a, a business standpoint you kind of have to have your niche where you're known and where you market yourself but for, for us, like, you know, COVID's been really interesting, I know, for us all, right? We're sitting at home, we're not going anywhere. Um, so Cree and I have explored some new ideas that we've never had a chance to do before. And it, it's tough to get motivated right now. I'm sure you guys have experienced the same thing. You're just like the news just is not good. And it's just no one's going anywhere. And, and it's hard to like self-motivate. But hopefully maybe tonight, if you haven't been shooting, you'll get some ideas and, and try to figure that out. Lighting is one thing that never goes away for, for me. This is an image that was shot through a tiny cut piece of glitter paper that's yellow and it's backlit with a speed light. If you saw the same photo without any of the lighting, it was pitch, it was just dead, overcast sky, deep shadow. Um, and this was part of one of our online classes, just showing how a simple speed light, a little bit of macro technique with that glitter paper that's yellow um, and you can combine a few things and create a really interesting photograph and you know how exciting is that so let's keep moving um, all sorts of ideas here what the subject matter aerials we'll talk a little bit about that and tulips a few other things and you know this is not meant to be like here's your myers brig we're going to give you four letters and that's who you are as a person tonight no not going to go there um, but we are i would encourage you guys to think a little harder about you and your own photography and 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 what you think you do good and maybe what you might want to try and what you think you don't do good now we always hear this and it's very true you're probably going to photograph what you're most passionate about that that's going to be your best work you like it, you may know a lot about it, maybe you know you have an inside line to something that your average person wouldn't have. Um, you're constantly thinking about it, so things that you're passionate about, it's a natural fit for your photography, and it's, and it's something that um, you're going to do well. So you know, it's, if you don't have the passion there, you're not probably going to take it to the lengths that you need to, to get the work that stands out about everybody else's. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. Now for, for me, landscape, travel, um, I, it's, it's all very compelling portraits, especially portraits on the road. I love um, that whole concept or even wildlife. It's, um, you know, what do you want to do? So here's one for you guys and i know i can only imagine the amount of experience you guys have in your group i'm sure there's a lot you guys have such a big group that is just i'm i'm it's i'm thrilled to see that honestly we just normally it seems like groups that we see are you know maybe 30 people they might have 100 members but you only see 20 you guys show up in force that's great so who knows what a five-year select is um 
Maybe you guys all do. This is something that you do if you have done portfolio reviews or, you know, through the years I've taught in universities, we work with editors. So we get all this stuff thrown at us. And we okay. and I feel like it's our mission to, to maybe, you know, pass on what we learn and, and maybe you don't know about this stuff. All that a five year select is, is you're reviewing your work. Really, that's all we're talking about here. But here's, here's the trick. You guys probably all use Lightroom and you probably make collections of the images that you like best. Maybe it's for a particular trip or subject matter, or maybe it's for a calendar year. A five year select is looking at the top 20 images. You could make it 40 if you really want to, but I'm going to say 20 from the last five years. Now you can also do this as a single year, but COVID's probably going to be kind of skimpy. Uh, you know, oh, it's a it's a can in the street. Oh, great. You know, oh, you know, it's the supermarket with people wearing masks. You know, maybe I don't want to see that for the the last year select. So let's go back a few more years. Um, well, why do you why would you do this? This is is going to give you a snapshot of who you are as a photographer, and you think you know who you are as a shooter. But I promise you guys, if you do this, you may learn something that you didn't know. All right, like here's, here's a classic example. Pick those top 20, put them in that collection in Lightroom. Run through there and say, the obvious questions are, well, what's the subject matter? I'm a landscape photographer. Okay, terrific. So you're, you're kind of putting a profile on your photographic identity. Um, I shoot portraits. How many of those are vertical? How many of the images are horizontal? The beauty of Lightroom? Look at the metadata. Try to figure out what lens did you use the most? Wow, I really used wide angles on all my landscapes. Okay, that makes a little bit of sense. A lot of us associate the grand landscape with the wide angle. Maybe you should start shooting it with the 70 to 200. Well, I don't see the whole scene. That's okay. We, you, you know, do what you do well, but then do something different. When you start to do this five year review of your, of your top work, you will see trends and things that identify you. And chances are these, these are your good photos. So these are the things you do well. It's equally important to see what you're not doing or what you might try that's different. Um, it's incredibly valuable. And Lightroom has made it so simple to run through your images, depending on how organized you are, which not it, you know, we're all working on that. How many collections and, and files can we have in there? Um, but it's a good way to give you direction on where to go every year. You guys see this on Instagram, right? Everyone does their last year in review and they'll, they'll do an Instagram post. Terrific. So they're kind of reviewing what, what their favorite photos were. Go deeper, go further back, ask harder questions about it. It's going to help you know where you're going to go. One of the things that you'll learn in that is what you maybe don't do so well and stuff you're still not comfortable doing. Um, this is part of being a creative, an artist, whatever you want to call it. When you pick up at your camera, we all have things that we're comfortable with, and then we have things that we're not so comfortable with. And I want to show you a lot of my mistakes. The one thing about presentations is, you know, of course we want to see the good work, but to get to those few images that somebody shows you in a presentation, there's thousands that were terrible. I mean, we can all relate to this as photographers. This is a shot I did easily 30 years ago on an editorial a magazine shoot. We are going around, uh, this is Superior, and we we're gonna go around Isle Royale. So I knew how to kayak. That, this was still back in the days where he can do all this stuff. He just doesn't know how to take a picture yet. And I was so proud of this photo. I sent it into the editor and I look at it today and I almost fall out of my chair. I'm like, oh my God, what were you thinking? The lighthouse, we got a perspective control issues here. We didn't have that button back in the day in Lightroom. This is slide days, right? You just hit the autocorrect and it just goes vertical. And then this is the classic wide angle polarizer problem. Half the photos polarized really nicely, deep and blue, and then the other half is bright. It's, it's a total disaster. I sent it right into the editor. What could go wrong? It looked great. Um, and then, you know, you, you, there's gonna be things that just know that experimentation, failure is okay. And I show you this, this is my adventure sports days. Let's put a camera housing on the front of a kayak. What could go wrong? Just looking at how it's jerry-rigged with two pieces of wood should say something, something will go wrong. And in this case, 
I had to use a self timer. I didn't have a, an electronic release on this. This is way ahead of all that stuff. Pocket Wizard was barely even around back then. And so I had to hit the button, grab the paddle and make sure I'm still paddling five seconds after the self timer goes off and hopefully get a photo. Well, eventually the entire housing snapped off, destroyed the front of the boat, just completely broke off. Not, not good, but so you're gonna get tons of failures. Maybe you get a picture out of it, maybe you don't, um, that's okay. And so here's another side of say, and I'm, I'm bleeding my soul out here to you guys right now. Um, people, I was a landscape guy when I started. I was in the tents, I was on the mountains, I was on the rivers. I love the wilderness, the outdoor aspect. I mean, I, that's still a big part of my work. And the thought of being a portrait photographer would put me in a cold sweat, honestly. But somehow through the years, I realized that the people were so important about the environment that I loved. And whether I'm in the woods and I just want to show the scale of, of how big something is, or maybe I'm traveling in this case in Egypt and, and there's some Bedouin kids, um, this is something I have to do. And so I forced myself to be a portrait photographer. I was intimidated to no end. I mean, I wasn't the extroverted, let me run up there and talk to these kids and get them you know, comfortable, I'm gonna take their photo. But I just kept doing this and I made mistake after mistake. My portrait work was a disaster. But the thing that I took away from this and, and maybe you guys can get something out of this too is I fully embraced something I wasn't familiar with. I was slightly interested in it. I dove in it headlong. I just made disaster after disaster, but eventually I learned and I got better at it. And then that helped me, ready for this? Shooting portraits helped me become a better landscape photographer. It's like, wait, how does that work? This portraits, they're two different things. They really aren't. I mean, yes, they're, the genres are different, but I think we get so narrow-minded in I shoot this and I shoot that, and you never give anything else a chance. And I think on a bigger creative level, um, broadening your horizons is not a bad thing. Now, I have to tell you, I have plenty of stories and I'll, I'm watching the clock, I'll keep talking here. This is what happens when you think you know something and you realize humility, you really don't. I was with the group in Vietnam years ago. I was telling them just what I'm telling you guys. I'm like, you guys, you gotta photograph the people. I know you're not people photographers. You just wanna shoot the landscapes, but you really need to work these photos. So I'm gonna show you, look at this mother and her daughter over here. I, now, just watch this, you guys. I'm going to go over there. I'm going to approach him. Watch my technique. Watch how I'm non-threatening. I'm a kind of a tourist here, and I'm just going to move in there, but I'm going to show you how to do this. So I kind of act like I'm looking at the flowers, and I'm slowly moving towards this mother and her daughter, and I'm like, oh my gosh, they're, look at their beautiful dress. This is going to be like the best portrait ever, and I'm so smug. My entire group's kind of watching like, wow, look at Tom. He's, this is really cool. Look at his technique, and I'm moving over there acting all nonchalant. And finally, I get up to where I'm really close. And of course, we don't speak the same language. So I'm just pointing at the camera and they're looking back at me and they're all smiles. And I'm thinking to myself, God, like in the last six days in Vietnam, I haven't found one person that's been so accepting of me to take a picture of them. So I start snapping shooting photos of these folks. Then I look over my shoulder and it totally hits me. These are Japanese tourists who I bought, you rent these little costumes and you walk around in this garden area. This is her husband and their, and their son. And they're out there taking pictures of these people from Japan wearing these costumes. I'm sure they're like authentic, you know, some kind of tribal Vietnamese. Complete is that credibility? Out the door for that one. That's okay, you know, things happen. So you just, you, you keep going and eventually you will find that real person. And it is, you know, it is a moment in time that you'll always hold on to. So failure comes with it. Lighting has been another, it's a lifelong obsession for me. Photography is so critical with lighting. I just can't imagine how anyone can be a photographer and not think lighting all the time because that is what makes or breaks a photograph. Sure, subject is important, but remember this, you are not photographing the subject, you are photographing the light hitting the subject. So if you can change the quality of that light to make the subject more interesting, that's a good thing. And so for me, I was always trying to figure out what else I could do. This is wake surfing off the back of a boat, and we decided to add some big stroke to it. 
and we and you can create a picture like this out of like an ordinary shot that just isn't even going to make the final cut um, on wherever you might send it. And you know, years and years of just mistake after mistake, but eventually figuring it out and, and just embracing that. So just remember this, you guys, um, we all love those images that show the hard work it took us to get there. But if I was speaking to a journalism school class right now, I would say the process of getting to that point is much more important than actually that picture. Now, the, the pictures is the you know, we get the candy at the end of the trail here. I mean, of course, we want those are how we're going to remember that it's going to inspire us to do more. We can't always not make good photos, but it's those moments in time getting to that spot that will define your style, who you are as a photographer, even though the public may see this image where you've really learned your chops here is in that other side. So remember that and continue that. Um, in those examples of this, this is lighting. I decided to bring studio lighting to a cliff and no one was doing this back in the day. Um, you know, maybe you shoot a, a, a aim a light at a cliff and it looks good, but how about cross lighting 40 feet up, like literal studio lighting style and technique, big box, small edgy lights, snoots, everything I would do in a studio, I'm just gonna put that on these super long light stands or hang it from a cliff and bring that sensibility, but put it in an environment that I really know, which is climbing. And, and when I first started doing this, everyone told me I was nuts. Editors hated it. I'd go into New York and they would be like, what are you thinking? It's so glossy. I couldn't help myself. I'm like, I know, but doesn't it look cool? I mean, it's just cool. Come on. I mean, how many shots have you seen of a cross-lit rock climber? Well, not many. I'm like, then I don't really care if it's good or not. I mean, I feel good that at least I tried it. And maybe there's not a dollar sign at the end of it for, for me, of course, trying to make a living at this, but then something happened. All of a sudden, a trend changed and other photographers, really talented climbing shooters too, were doing the same thing. And all of a sudden, there's this huge explosion of lighting in the outdoor arena of photography. And so sometimes you, you actually have success. Sometimes you never get, it never goes anywhere, but it's still important to try it. One of the funniest shoots I ever had, and it was all of trying this lighting stuff, was getting a call and saying, Tom, we want you to photograph a wedding. I don't photograph weddings, fully respect people that do. They are just not for me. I mean, I am more intimidated at photographing a wedding than I am like uh, an Olympic athlete or, or a celebrity. I mean, oh my God, give me that any day over the emotions that roll with the wedding. I mean, that, woo, I still, maybe I need to try it again. Um, and they're like, well, if you had to photograph a wedding, what would you do? And I'm like, well, just completely joking. Of course, I would hang them off the side of a cliff and we would marry them on a cliff. They're like, great idea. I'm like, no, that's not a great idea. They're like, no, it's a great idea. I'm like, why did I open my big mouth? So I wound up having to shoot a wedding, a vertical wedding on the side of a cliff. Now, for any of you guys that can think back to that wedding, or maybe you're not married, or maybe you had a kid that just got married, you know, you go in, you get fitted for the bride's dress, the groom, all that. These two models are friends of mine. I had to find these folks that could be climbers. Obviously, they're going to be dangling for hours in harnesses on the side of a cliff. So they got to be climbers. These two people in the wedding dress here and, you know, the tie and the tux man, they're dirtbag climbers. I'm like, how about you want to make some money? You just got to pretend you're going to act like you're going to get married for this huge photo shoot. You're going to be in all these magazines, gleam, you know, glory, money. It's all coming your way. They're like, oh, OK, this is Tom. He's crazy on this photo idea again. But sure, we'll do it. We always need a little a little cash. So these two get ready to get married, even though they're just boyfriend, girlfriend. Now, number one, we go in and we get fitted for this dress. Oh, my gosh. When you bring out a pair of scissors and you start slicing through the gown that you just bought for for a thousand bucks, there's a moment of silence in the, like the bridal shop. Everyone's like, but they're like, no, no, she's going to wear a harness underneath this. We got to make sure that we can cut a hole through here to get. So it's pretty funny. So we had a lot of fun with this whole thing. Of course, it was, you know, we had a film crew that came up and was all set up and but we were we were loving it. But then the worst thing that could ever happen on an assignment here. This is Tom's tip for commercial photography. If you ever get the last minute desperate phone call from the models the night before, always a bad sign. Oh, can't make it. Oh, I'm sick. Oh, I don't like the clothes I'm going to wear. No, 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 no. This is, we've been planning this stuff for months. You don't get to say that. So Zach, the guy in here, phone's ringing. 
no, no, no. I don't take these phone calls the night before shoot. Zach, Tom, oh, what's going on? He's like, listen, you know that big shoot we're going to do tomorrow? I'm like, you can't cancel. He's like, I'm not going to cancel. This, you can't make this stuff up, you guys. I mean, this, I still think back to this and it's like out of some like Hollywood script. He's like, listen, do you remember when Corey, that's his, that's the girlfriend, when she came out of that room and she was in that beautiful dress and had all that makeup on? And I mean, I'd never seen her in a wedding dress before. I'm like, duh. He's like, she looked amazing. I've decided I'm actually going to really ask her to get married tomorrow on the photo shoot. I'm like, oh, no, you're not. You are not getting married on my photo shoot. Save it for another day, buddy, because I need you to be focused like on the photo shoot. He's like, nope, I'm going to pop the question. Who knew, right? I mean, this is just crazy. So we did the whole photo shoot. It was super fun, really crazy. The, they needed to see the lights for the final thing. The only thing that Zach told me was, he's like, hey, Tom, I don't want to have our actual proposal on video or on camera or anything like that. I just want to pop the question when everything's kind of breaking down. I'm like, man, demands, geez, I'm taking more out of your salary, all 20 bucks of it. And he's like, bummer. So we got some fun photos. Um, anyway, so you can see where this all led me with just trying new things. And then here's the final shot. They actually really did get married. They're still married today. They, this video, by the way, if you want to see it, just type uh, Tom Bull Cliffside Wedding on Google and you will see this is still up on Ellen Chrome's site. You can see the whole thing. It's pretty entertaining. And now you know the backstory. They actually did get married. So we all evolved through time. This is important. It's, it's part of the creative process. When I say evolve through time, here's another thought I would just have you guys remember. Um, you will never reach um, photographic nirvana. Uh, I feel like it's a continuum. We all get better. We are technically more adept. Maybe we see subject matter differently through the years. But it's very dangerous when you start to rest on your laurels and say, I got landscapes down. I, I check, no problem. Maybe you're good at it, um, but you can always get better. Um, I will be the first to tell you, um, you know, it doesn't matter where I'm going, what the assignment is, who I'm talking to, whatever. Um, the moment that you are saying that, yeah, I got it down, it's, that's, that's a slippery slope for me anyway, because so much of my career and improving creativity has been that desire to, to go different, try something else. So this was my first bird photograph 30 years ago. Oh, I was so proud of this. I mean, this is terrible, right? This is out of our cabin in Alaska. So 30 years from that, now I still do bird photos, but I've learned a few new things. Um, you continue to evolve. Who knows what this will look like, you know, five years from now, maybe I'll be doing something totally different with birds. Landscape photography. This was right near where we lived in Alaska. You know, we had this just dreamy scenery in our backyard. This is such a snapshot. It's like, I, I look at this, I'm like, okay, yeah, great. It's, it's a pretty blue lake, but man, there is no camera craft involved here. This is barely pointing the camera. Um, but then I got better and I started to think about light and texture and graphic design. Um, and, and you evolve, you'll go through time. Now, a few other things to mention before we jump into tips that you guys can take along. I, I, I love to talk about these things. And I, when I make fun about this stuff, literally I'm talking about myself. This is a great one. I don't see it. The dreaded question. You're in the art gallery. You're staring at abstract art. The people on either side of you are just going on and on. And they're like saying all these things about this thing. You're, you're looking at this and you're like, I just see kind of like some colors and some weird looking paper. And they're like, oh my gosh, I'm so emotionally, you know, taxed by that. And you're like, wow, I am just, I am, I am a creative loser. I don't see any of that. Um, that was me. Um, we have a Center for Fine Art Photography here in Colorado. I've taught down there endlessly and I've, I've met some really, you know, nationally recognized fine art photographers down there. And it's been so interesting for me to chat with them. They put up, oh yes, this was, you know, the moon kind of represented how the industrial revolution was destroying America and fall matched the, the low harvest crop year. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, all that I see is like some moons superimposed with like a, some kind of weird smokestack sticking. And so why I say this is, don't get me wrong, I fully respect fine art photography. My message is this, you don't have to know it all. 
and it's okay not to. You can still do good work in whatever it is. You will always, part of being an artist or a photographer is always having, there's a little side in there, probably in all of us, where we're just not sure. We're just kind of like, I wonder if this is good or I just don't get it, but I bet you they do. So I'm just not going to say anything. Oh, yeah. You kind of go in that, uh huh, uh huh. You kind of get in that auto drive. Mm, yeah, no kid. Yeah, cool. Uh, who, was, who was mentioning this earlier? Ken or somebody who's sitting on Facebook or Instagram? Awesome. Far out. Looks good. Great. <laughs> it's like translate. I don't get it. Um, so that's okay. Just embrace that. Roll with it. Don't let it slow you down. It happens. Um, you're going to find images that do work for you, whatever it is. Street photography, landscape photography, wildlife photography. Move forward. Okay. So we want to learn some things. Give me some stuff to take away, Tom. I, I, give me something to go with. I, you're making me think now we, wanna, we want concrete steps. Um, here's one part of everything involved here, and this has been the hardest one for COVID and 2020, and that's just shooting. I mean, I swear, I don't know about you guys, but when COVID hit, um, we had just gotten back. If you want to hear our COVID moment, we were in Japan photographing geishas and, and cranes when that cruise ship, if you remember back in the headlines, showed up at the port in like Tokyo or just outside of Tokyo, and the entire cruise ship got COVID. We're sitting there with our group going out for sake going, you know, what is it about this COVID stuff? It sounds kind of serious. And um, little did we know, holy smokes, where this is all going to go. And so like many of us, um, we, Kree and I were, I, I, we bench watched every series on Netflix. I mean, I, it was kind of great for like the first two weeks. I didn't even leave the couch. I'm just like, oh my God, I've never been home. I mean, our, my normal year here, I'm home for like less than a month, probably a few weeks, even if that. I was home for months. I got all the net. I could talk to my friends about Netflix series like a normal human. I wasn't, you know, coming back with, you know, crazy stories of being wherever. So anyway, keep shooting. It can be hard to do. Um, you've got to do that to continue to grow, to see new things. Um, there's just so many examples. The more you shoot, the more you'll see, the more you'll recognize possibilities in whatever it is you like to photograph. So simply enough. Outhouse in Alaska. Yeah, it's kind of funny. Everybody's coming in out there. But you know what? That could be a great photograph. If I knew a little bit about lighting, a little bit about white balance, counter filtration, set the white balance to 3200, underexposed, one stop so it's deep purple, add a speed light, radio transmitter, put an orange CTO gel on there. You get this beautiful warm on cool. One of the oldest techniques in the book graphically warm advances off a of cool so your vision will grow with knowing more about technique lighting all this kind of stuff so let's keep going so the last thought and hopefully you're getting a little of this from me the other little personal side of me is does anybody know who this photographer is i, I know you're all muted i'll let you know um, this is galen rawl um he's he's no longer with us uh, but he was a mountain climber and he photographed in Nepal and in places like Patagonia down there with the horses. And literally in the beginning of my career, over 30 years ago, he came to Anchorage. I met him through a friend. I was a nobody, still am a nobody, but I mean, I was a climber and he was a climber and a photographer, but a famous one. And so I got to have dinner with him. And it was like my moment of like brushing up against stardom. I was just so blown away at his passion what he talked about. Uh, I just was like, just nonstop just sat there at dinner and stared at me. I don't think I could even say a word. I was like, this is the guy I want to be. I mean, this is this famous photographer. And he's like talking to me. I couldn't believe it. Um, and so he was a huge inspiration for me in my career. And I've, I've been inspired by many others and students. Don't know, by the way, on workshops and talks like this, never think that inspiration doesn't come from everybody in the group. I sometimes you know, when we do a workshop, for instance, I get tons of ideas and inspiration from the other people in the group. That's the power of a workshop. We, you might all know the technique, but maybe you don't know the area, but I guarantee you don't know what the other person will shoot. And, and that's one of the most exciting things for Cree and I in workshops is just that collaborative effort and seeing what people do. But anyway, so I saw Galen. I said, I got to go to Patagonia. I didn't, I, you know, I'd been there, but I didn't know anything about these mountains. And so I went and I've continued to go there for the last 20 years. And it's just, it was kind of my full circle. Um, 
Just remember, we all have a mix, right brain and left brain. If you're a left brain person, maybe you're a little more organized and, and give me a grid, give me rules to follow. It makes more sense to me that way. So there's that aspect of it for us all. And then there's right brain, which is more creative. I don't want to see any grids. Let me just throw it all up there and it's going to look good. Um, by the way, I figured out how to Without even talking to someone, I can tell who's right and left brain on a workshop. I got it down now. You tell them to use a tripod and take a landscape. And the folks that are left brain, they're going to set up that tripod, lock on their tight, and they will have a razor sharp photo. The right brain folks will set up their tripod, but they actually won't use it. They'll do it because they were said they were supposed to do it. It's pretty funny. It's very true. So we, we have a mix of this. And we need to figure out where we fall left or right brain and how to improve. So let's Let's, let's move into the stuff that you probably really want to talk about. So we've all heard the exposure triangle, right? 101, you guys all know this. ISO shutter speed aperture, that determines exposure. What if I told you there was one of these triangles for composition and creativity? Hmm, that's a thought. So there's vision, you're driving the ship here. So your vision, you have to have ideas. To, to make it happen. You, you, you can't follow everyone. You can get ideas from others, but then you'll probably build on those or go your own way. And then you got to know how to run the camera. Camera craft 101. There's, you're thinking aperture, shutter speed, ISO. Oh, so much more. Um, and then there's graphic design. What is your background or how much do you know about what color and what emotion subliminally you get as being humans? Um, there's so many things there. So between the three of these, I like to think of this so often when we quote the, the, when we talk about exposure, the exposure triangle, we're going to call this the composition triangle. So here's a couple, let me throw these at you, 15 rules that will maybe give you food for thought. Everyone knows the rule of thirds, right? I mean, that's what I started with, but there's so many more interpretations of these golden rules and their interpretations. Now, we all know that giving you a hard concrete use this overlay these are just guidelines. They don't necessarily say you'll get a better photograph, but it may force you to look a different way. Let me put it this way. We've been teaching online classes for months now, and we do like we have an advanced landscape class and all these different ones. We go way beyond the rule of thirds. Stuff that people who have photographed for years are saying, God, Tom, you talked about that Fibonacci spiral. I tried, to, I tried to use it. You, by the way, it's in Lightroom. If you don't know, just go Shift O. Turn on the crop tool, hit Shift O, and you can toggle through the different overlays. You'll see the Fibonacci. And there, my images now are, they, what was so fun about our class is we had folks that had a favorite photo that was in their past five year top 20 shots. They tried the Fibonacci on it and it made it a better shot. Now that's not always going to happen all the time, but my whole point here is there are a lot of different ways to, to apply overlays if you really want to get into concrete, tangible, like do this, see what happens. Now this is based on this mathematical formula. You can look it up. It's an Italian mathematician way back in the day who came up with this idea. And it's this idea of these ideal proportions that interestingly enough occur in nature all over the, the galactic core, DNA strands, a conch shell. I mean, just on and on and on. So if you also look, one of the other things that happens when you apply that Fibonacci is instead of getting a rule of thirds, you get a phi grid. So things are a little tighter. Where those lines cross, we always use that as like, well, that's where I'm supposed to put things. Well, the phi grid is saying, hey, maybe move it into center a little bit more. Well, let's see what that looks like. Now we all know the rule of thirds. Here's Denali. Um, if you ever get a chance to go to Alaska, drive out, you'll have to take a park bus or a lodge bus. And if it's a clear day, they'll stop at this over. This is an overlook shot, right? And so, but it's exciting. It's Denali. It's actually out. It's so often covered when you go up there. And you do this photo. And I, I, I've taken this photo many times for many years. And I just always loved it because it's Denali. I used to be a climbing guide on Denali. So I'm seeing this. And I'm like, I'm just going to love this picture no matter what. But then I put the Fibonacci on. I'm like, hey, you know, there might be more going on here other than the fact that I just love Denali. Um, it, where that curl ends in that final little spiral, placing the subject there adds tension. It, it makes more of a non-traditional crop. Some images it'll work great with. Others, it's not going to great with. Not, not saying that it, you must do this and get a, 
a, a great looking crop every time, but something to try. Look at an image like this. This is not following the rule of thirds at all. It's using the Fibonacci in street photography and trying to get outside of that rule of thirds, which as a landscape photography, you know, photographer was just ingrained in me when, when I was first starting out. Um, the phi grid, moving things a little more to the center. So you guys, this is a simple one, right? This is a very easy one. Now we all know the rule of thirds. It works. It's symmetrical, even squares. So it's, it's, it's static in some ways, but it's pleasing. Um, things are in harmony. We like that as humans. We, we like harmony. We, we like order. So it does work. And then, of course, rules are, be, are made to be broken. Um, if, if it doesn't work with the phi grid or the rule of thirds, you say graphically, the sky is interesting here. I only need to ground this image with a little bit of landscape, but I'm going to move past all the stuff that we just talked about. So if I gave you one of your homework assignments here, check out the Fibonacci. It's in Lightroom. Shift-O, Shift-O. You'll toggle through the different overlays. You'll see the triangle and a bunch of, you'll see the rule of thirds. Try it out, just give it a whirl, see what happens. You may see things a little bit different. So just remember, um, we're, we're not here to give you rules, but we're just trying to give you maybe a unique spin on some existing work. Um, and maybe, maybe it'll take you to a different place. So compositional subtraction, there's a lot of terms for this. And it basically just says this, scrutinize your photo and decide what needs to be in there and what doesn't. And if you can't explain to yourself or your partner beside you why that's in that picture, it probably shouldn't be in there. It's a great way to clean up shots. Um, do I need all these clouds? I really don't want that cloud on, on the far side there. Now, yeah, it was interesting, um, Donna brought this up and this is very important. If you start to remove or place subject matter in an image, you're crossing a, a boundary there in terms of what might be acceptable for an editor, for a photo contest. So I'm gonna leave that up to you and where you fall and maybe what the end use is gonna determine that. But I'm gonna take away that cloud on the left because it doesn't need to be there. It's just distracting. Now, oftentimes it's just simply shifting your camera. Don't need that strip of ground on the bottom there. It's not helping. This is about texture, color, pattern. So let me take the cross section of trees. That's the statement here, not that bottom part. This is another tough one. A beautiful scene in Tasmania could not figure out an angle to eliminate those bottom two boulders. So I'm gonna take them out in Photoshop. Um, it's, it's now it's the rule of odds. Is anybody familiar with the rule of odds? Three better than two. Three create, causes the eye to move through an image more dynamically than just a pairings. So that's a whole nother one. We're not gonna talk about that tonight, but okay, number three. Um, everyone's like, somebody told me that this was on the internet um, and this was a little while back. They're like, somebody was just writing and they said, the most overdone thing in landscape photography right now is slow motion. And I thought about that a second and I'm like, yeah, it's, it's very popular, um, but I, I'm always very leery of just kind of pigeonholing something and saying, it's right or wrong. I really feel like it's, it's does it matter to the photographer and what they were trying to say. So um, I love incorporating motion into my images, whether it's at the camera or it's the subject matter. So often when you say motion, people just think five second exposure of a river could be that. Maybe it's a five second exposure moving the camera. I mean, there's a lot of ways to look at this, but there's something else that I've learned with my exposure a uh, longer exposure photography. And it does add that silky kind of water, but it also can actually create lines and different graphic qualities. Nothing to do with the mood, but more about actually, wow, let me show you what I mean here. So here's your classic shot. It's maybe some of you've been to Iceland. This is Vic, a very popular place. It's just beautiful there. Um, it's so much fun just to roam around that island. Everywhere you point a camera, it's, it's gorgeous. So this is the slow-mo surf shot, kind of lends itself to, you know, evoking that feeling to the shot and making it interesting. That's terrific. But now look what happens here. Another, you know, very iconic coastal scene. We've all seen the 12 apostles. Um, and so you're there and you're saying, okay, by the way, if you haven't been there, there's nowhere you can go. You're on a railing in a little spot. You can't rappel off the edge. Trust me, if you can rappel somewhere, I'll be the first to do it. You can't, not allowed. You will not be able to do that. But what I've learned with motion is you can't just brand it and say three second surf shot, it'll look great. Water moves at different levels, scenes are different, 
rocks stick up, lines form or are not formed depending on your shutter speed, what that white component of this image is, is completely dictated by how long or short the shot is. And I can stretch out and further reinforce curving lines in this image just by thinking my way through long shots. So um, look at this image. If I had taken this at a 30th of a second, disaster. The water wouldn't be nearly as drawn and long. It would be kind of a little bit of white water, but not really. It'd have a little motion, but not enough. But when I shoot it really long, all that white water really feathers and straight lengthens out. So it, it's perfect. It creates this leading line that's going to draw me into the shot. This is a great example of where everyone thinks of long exposure as kind of a mood component. I'm thinking it of I need to enhance the length of the lines in the water to point my viewer in the image. Try that one on for size, something maybe a little different. Of course, we know slow-mo is beautiful for pan and blur and creating movement. Doing shots like this, you know, they just imply energy, frenetic energy. It's a taxi cab driver in, in Cuba. How to do them other than just a static shot? This is push-pull. So this movement is at the lens. It's a 70 or it's probably a 24 to 70 where I'm zooming in, zooming out during a long exposure. Um, half second created these beautiful diagonal lines on this surf line. Longer than that, it just was all cotton white. Shorter than that, and they didn't have definition. Diagonal lines imply movement. Um, it's, it's adding tension to a photo. For a stormy scene, terrific. We like that. So, OK. So let's keep moving on. Lots of examples of movement and motion. Dimension is such the challenge for us. We photograph the three-dimensional world and it's rendered on a flat two-dimensional screen or it's on the wall hanging in a gallery somewhere. How can I represent dimension in photography? This is a big important topic. It doesn't matter what you photograph. Um, this is part of, of the art of photography and, and trying to figure out where you can go with that. Well, there's a couple little tricks here and guidelines and, and only a few of which I'll have a chance to talk about tonight. Vanishing point is terrific. What that implies is you're wide at the, at the front end and it pinches off in the background and it creates this amazing feeling of depth and dimension in a shot. So endless examples of this. Boardwalks, you can think of this. Road, of course, if you've been to Palouse, this just sings Palouse, but feel the depth in this photo. This is Vanishing Point working heavily to create the scene that it feels like you could drive for miles into. Now, it doesn't always have to be a road. Um, anything that starts wide and pinches off further into the frame creates a sense of dimension. A great thing, more often than not, to have in your photographs. Just starting at a wide tree trunk and pinching off at the top. Same idea. So you guys get it. How many, you know, just go beyond the road and the path and the dock. There's so many things in nature. Um, or other types of subject matter that you'll use vanishing point to create depth. It's very key. Now, this one's easy. You either love it or hate it. Black and white. I don't do black and white. <laughs> um, I want to give you an assignment. This is your next assignment. Here's one beautiful thing about most of the cameras today. You can set in your camera the camera to shoot in black and white. If you are shooting in raw, it's going to depend on your camera system. For me, shooting in Nikon, I can turn my camera on and make it black and white. So I'm out there taking pictures, all this, looking at images in black and white while I'm taking them. Then when I bring them back and put them on the computer here, because they were raw, it's still color. So it's the best of both worlds. I think to really learn and, and, and get something out of shooting in black and white, you need to do it in the field in real time. Everyone says never shoot in black and white because it's so much harder to convert from black and white to color. This is totally true. But remember, your camera may allow you to do that and still not lose the color. Um, it, I, I think it's very less effective if you shoot in color, bring it home, and then convert to black and white. If you want to learn to see in black and white, and I speak coming from a journalism background and starting in black and white, um, it's so terrific. We have these Z cameras, the new Nikon Zs. Cree and I will run down to Old Town, our little city town here in Fort Collins. This kind of some has some fun old buildings in it. We'll set it to black and white. I can't tell you how, as much as I think I'm seeing in tonalities and textures, the things that bring black and white to life, when I am reviewing in black and white in the field, 
I completely shift how I shoot. So this is a great self-assignment for you guys. Even if you don't black and white, it will force you to look graphically at a scene very differently because you're, you lose color. You have that emotional just blah out there that's attacking you, it goes away. So now it's very hard graphic line, shape, texture. So, so great. So I think trying out black and white, no matter what you like to shot, what if we all have time, right? You can do this in the local park. You don't have to go to exotic places in the world. Um, I think it will help all forms of your photography. And now with modern cameras, it, it makes it easier than ever to do that. So um, this was an editorial shoot, a pinup girl. And I, I saw this photo and I absolutely loved it. I'm like, this is gonna be my, my favorite photo of the year. Um, we, you know, she's a model, this is all stylized out. But I, now this is not taken in the field as black and white, but trying to see things differently, I'm like, this would be a terrible black and white. No, actually, I like this image better as a black and white, even though pinup is so much about pink balloons. I mean, come on, we gotta have pink balloons. But then just her makeup, her skin tone, how it's processed to make it very almost blown out, creamy skin. Um, I absolutely love this as a black and white. I learned something, I'm, you know, as much as I think I know about black and white, you know, there's always something else out there. So I would highly encourage you guys, give it a shot. You know, you may, you, you may hate it, but, but doing something that you are really not that psyched about doing, it may not be a bad thing. And if you have time, you know, why not give it a spin? You might be shocked at what you, you learn or start to think differently photographically. Can't say enough about emotion. <clears throat> um, it, I, I honestly feel 99% um, of the, the best images have a very strong emotional impact. And what I'm saying with that is the viewer is looking at an image and they are getting a response. They, you cannot just look at that and be like, yeah, that's nice. The photographer has done their job. They, they have really gotten this, this, this feeling out of you. Now, I'm gonna go back to the landscape photographers um, and I'm talking about myself, right? You, emotion in the landscape, come on. You know, if the grizzly bear is running at me, I get it. It's the smiling child, happy kid. This is that, this is that left brain person talking again. I need to shift into my right brain mode here and think a little more outside the box, not so literal, and think well, what colors evoke what emotions and can I apply that in landscape work? Um, maybe it's just, we all love pets. I mean, I am a sucker for dogs. If I see a dog on the street anywhere in the world, chances are I'll lie down and try to get a photo. By the way, I did learn something about this. When you lie down, I'm, I'm over six feet, so big guy runs up, lies down, has long black thing in hand, pointing at a dog. Sometimes the dogs think that's great. Other times they're like, attack, <laughs> so just be careful. Um, but you, you know, pick up on the vibe of the animal and the owner. Uh, gotta try that though. Um, but you know, maybe it's humor um, or maybe it's, got, I love these sheep. This is just coming around the corner. They look so guilty to me. They're like, oh my God, I didn't do it. Did you do it? No, I didn't do it. Um, but there's an emotional quality to it. So you find something different. Um, or certainly when we talk about people, the whole range of emotions could be captured in a photograph. In this case, the passion of tango, um, or maybe it's just kids on the street and they're obviously our, our best friends. And um, remember this with portraits too, and this is off topic slightly. Um, really a portrait, I always tell people when I'm doing portfolio reviews or whatever the case may be, a successful shot really is going to represent the connection you had with the subject. I mean, there's, there's a, a, a very famous editor um, in, in the country here. She's the head of the Washington Post, and she's, she's a friend. And I had her look at my work one time. She's won, they have awards, actually, Lucy's for, like, the best editor in the United States. She won that. So I'm like, oh, my gosh, you know, she's going to know everything here. So I had her look at my work. She looked at, like, three pictures, and it was like I was getting some Freudian, like, analysis of my childhood. She's like, oh. I can see that you were picked on by your big brother and you have huge insecurities when you get around other people. And you, I'm like, wait a second, you, just, you looked at my portfolio and three, but the point that she was making is she's like, I'm looking at your interpretation of the subject and the subject's interpretation of you. And so when it comes to people photography, she's like, you can pick up. If it's street photography and you're engaging the subjects, we're gonna see how successful you are. These kids in this particular shot, 
no, no help from me because I had a, a, some other people with me that were fantastic with kids. Um, but they're happy. They're very open to the camera. So that, that often defines a good portrait. But think about landscapes. There's an emotional, almost a spiritual quality to the light. Once again, the light can be the equalizer here. Don't run into this. And I do this all the time. Technically perfect shot of waterfall. Absolutely completely boring, right? Right f-stop on a tripod, light could be better, but I got it. Yeah, you did. I mean, you've recorded that. There, there's nothing wrong with that. You got to take it to the next level, though. Find, find a stormy scenes. Change up your perspective. Use a different shutter speed. Draw the viewer in. Create some kind of mood or feeling when they're looking into your image. You just can't be the technician with no emotion behind it. I, you know, we all fall into that trap to one degree or another. So remember that. Um, powerful images, connect the viewer with your emotions to that shot. Um, and it doesn't always have to be, uh, you know, I, so often we kind of pigeonhole this into an animal or person. It's remember color generates responses in us all. Orange is inviting, it's warm, it's friendly. It brings us in to this picture. You, you have a happy feeling when you're seeing a shot like that, very different than say a blue colder scene. So a few other things I just want to remember, and this is getting into it, my next point. Remember, we all see the scene, but, but really what it comes down to is how you interpret it. So it, your photograph is, is not what you see, it's how you see it. We all saw this mountain with interesting light in Iceland, but how many people chose the long lens versus the wide angle? And neither one is right or wrong here, but that's what defines us as photographers. Never forget that, there's, there's a lot at play here. Um, shots like this, this, you're gonna see my favorite mountain many times in here, Denali again, right? Um, but it's a cool, if you photograph Denali, you know that this is in the wee hours of the night because of course the Northern latitudes and sunset it's like midnight or so up there. So, but you get tranquil scenes like this and it's just, it just, for me, you know, that, that shot sums it up. All right, number eight, this is easy. Um, everyone talks about improved autofocus and better dynamic range. And there's so many things that are happening right now in photography and they're all fantastic, don't get me wrong. Um, I mean, autofocus alone in the mirrorless and watching how that's progressing, Wow, it's fascinating. And you guys remember the days of Velvia? Does anybody shoot Velvia? I mean, that was my, my favorite slide film back in the day, but it had such a narrow latitude. I mean, we're talking barely four stops. The, you just knew the shadows were gonna ink up and you're like, ah, but man, did those colors look good in the contrast. Now, 10, 15 stops. I mean, how much can we nurse out of one digital raw file? It's incredible. So there's a lot of focus on that. But if you ask me, I think probably the most game-changing element of all this has been ISO performance. Think about it. You may get better autofocus performance, so you get a few more bird shots in focus. But I can go into a dark room now, crank up my ISO to 12,000, and take photos for hours that I couldn't do not that long ago. Um, and it's only going to get better. So here's a question I have for you guys. We all know you're, you know, stay in that lower ISO, less noise, makes sense, can push it a little bit, going to get a little faster shutter speed or be able to work in darker environments. Um, but how many of you, number one, know what the, the highest ISO is on your camera? Ask yourself, do you know what that is? I, I got a D6 in here. I'm a Nikon fanatic, of course. We shoot a lot of wildlife. Got to get a D6. 3 million, 3.2 million is the highest ISO. So you're saying, well, we all know that and it's completely unusable. Let me tell you a little story. We did, this is part of our advanced landscape class or, or maybe creative camera craft. We did, we've been doing these for months now. We had a woman and I, this is part of the class. I'm like, you guys need to figure out your highest ISO in your camera, select it, go out in probably near darkness and take a bunch of photos. How many people have actually done that? Shot a photo at the highest ISO. I, you know, for the longest time I hadn't, but then you got time on your hands. So I wonder what this looks like. This woman was living on a farm in Missouri. She had cattle on her property. I can't remember her camera. She went out, set it to the highest ISO, which was like 52,000, uh, I think was her upper limit. 
and shot all these cattle. Now, if you told me about that on paper, I would be like, oh my God, this is gonna be a disaster. She showed us these cows, I'm not making this stuff up, at 52,000 ISO, it was incredible. I mean, it was that fine art where you're trying to like come up with some metaphor, some way to describe the scene. It was, it, I was looking at this going, I'm going to take what I just learned from this student and I'm gonna do a photo story on it for one of the photo magazines. It had, of course, it looked grainy and surreal. You're at the upper echelon of your ISO, but, but that only lent itself to the whole mood and feeling of the shot. And I, I learned something out of that. I mean, I dabbled and done this, but as I watched this photo essay of cattle in Missouri at like dusk, I was blown away. And, and so I learned something. And so this is what I would pass on to you. Try a shot at the highest ISO of your camera. You're gonna say, you know, the magazines and the internet tell us it'll be unusable. I saw that review on this channel or that. You can't shoot that ISO. I'm, it's probably all true, but what do you got to lose? I've seen work that was uh, unbelievable at the highest ISO. So enough said. Um, back to my point. Shots like this in Cuba, street scenes, photography, that was impossible not that long ago because we didn't have ISOs that we could tap into are now something we can all do. So if you have not shot a photo at ISO 6400 on your camera, that typically is a, a higher limit, but a usable limit for so many of the cameras right now. So if you've never explored that, it's worth exploring because it will open up new doors and new ways for you guys to shoot. Uh, you saw a bunch of Japan shots there. Everywhere we went in Japan was like indoor arenas, fish markets, geishas, Everything was at 32 and 6,400. It all looked great. I mean, you guys are, are, I'm sure I heard a number of you mentioning Lightroom and, and things before we got started here. So there's great ways to reduce noise there. It's going to look probably better than you might think. Um, this was a shot I did years ago in Mongolia, and it wound up running as a double page truck um, in a magazine story. I was shooting out the bus window as we're ripping across these terrible roads they have in Mongolia. And this was back when ISO 6400 was like revolutionary. And I was trying it out. I'm like, oh, well, they said I could shoot at 6400. And so then it got published. And for me, that was my validation. I'm like, an editor saw it, they ran a double page. Uh, I mean, I'm in, I mean, wow, this stuff is for real. So just don't ever forget about that. Um, okay. Let's keep moving. You can think of all these other beautiful little light scenarios. I want to keep going here because I'm going to watch our time. Um, so shoot, try out that high ISO. You guys might be shocked at what you get out of it. Compress the scene. Just another way of saying what's important and zoom in on it. We talked about compositional subtraction. This is kind of the, the yin and yang to that. So you, you go to the Alabama Hills, Mount Whitney, the Sierras, it's very overwhelming. Have you ever felt that when you, you come to a landscape, you're just so excited about it, but you just can't seem to get it in the photo. It's like, how can I bring this back and show someone? And it's a little overwhelming. The answer for me on many shots like that is, we'll find the most interesting part. What's graphically strong? Well, look in the upper right corner there. It's, it, now that's Mount Whitney. If you know California, that's the 14 or the big peak there. But it also happens to have the most interesting part of that scene. So I put on, Nikon makes this beautiful little 500 millimeter PF face for an L5, tiny little thing. You can put that on, it's like the 7200. You can't believe how small the thing is. But I can do a shot like this. Just put it on and bam, go ahead and get that. So you, many examples here. Th this is a photo is, is maybe fine, but really the strong graphic qualities are down in these lower hills. So I'm zooming in. I'm going to take the viewer to what's graphically the most powerful in the shot. Um, think about this. Remember, you, you hear the, we, Cree and I call these um, landscape uh, compression or compression landscapes, whatever you want to call it. All that you're doing is you're just altering the size and perspective of subject matter such that there's less middle ground and things are bigger. So it, in, it, it, it makes the scene that feels maybe bigger than it actually is. These sand dunes are way behind the sky, but because we shot it with a long lens, this was key for the portrait. It's not gonna fly with the 24 to 70 or anything else. No, this is like, go out there, do you please walk that ridge towards us. Let us put on our long lenses because we're focused on bringing in that background. So, all right. Five more to go. Dimension, we've already kind of talked about it. A few other statements that I love. Light illuminates the subject. Shadow gives it dimension. 
Shadow and light are important. HDR is terrific, but remember, shadow gives dimension. Um, so we do architecture and we'll get we'll do travel assignments where we're working interiors for a magazine. And we have to be careful that we don't make it shadowless. I mean, I'd love that shadow slider in Lightroom. I can just reef away and bring it all open. But I've had to bring myself back in control a little bit because shadow is just as important as highlight so often, especially as it relates to dimension. So anything that you can do framing um, silhouettes like this, this is kind of going back to what we said earlier, reflections are a great one. It gives you a portal into a different part of the scene that you can't see literally. A very I'm sure you guys have all photographed reflections. Here's one for you, a great way to create dimension is warm on cool. Warm colors advance off of cool colors. If you've ever watched a Stanley Kubrick film, he was famous for, it's almost a film noir -y kind of look. Warm lighting on the, on, the, on the actors, cool backgrounds. They just pop off the big screen. It's the same in still photography. We can create dimension and depth by using this color palette of warm and cool. And it can also be what's lit and what's in shadow. It's both gonna work. Framing is a very simple one, obviously a, a great way to add dimension, putting on the wide angle, trying to find that non-traditional view. Um, reflections, um, it literally is like a, it's, it's like a TV show, like a other dimensional universe. I mean, it really can be a play in a photograph. It's something that I always look for. A rainy day on a travel trip is a great day because umbrellas come out, they create new round shapes, Reflections show up on the street. What a terrific thing to go explore and walk around that may be gone in a couple hours. So think reflections. All right, here's another one for you guys. A little camera crafty on this one. How many people know if your camera does multiple exposures? Okay, you're saying yes or no. Then my next question is to you, do you know what the upper limit of multiple exposures are? And then my third question to you is, what are you going to do with multiple exposures? It was the gimmick for the longest time. Why would I shoot multiple exposures? I don't like those kind of photographs. And it's so obvious it's a multiple exposure. Let me show you a few that it's maybe not so. Let me give the landscape shooters uh, maybe a new way to a technique that'll help you on a few things. Here's number one. If you shoot consecutive frames on a tripod, you will get the same effect as using an ND filter and slowing down, say a five or a 10 second shot. You forgot the ND filter. You're on your way to Iceland, land of waterfalls, moving streams and crashing waves. Got to have a way to slow that stuff down. Don't panic. You're going to use multiple exposure. Try three frames at the slowest exposure you can get. That's what this image is of. It looks like it was done with an ND, but really it's just three frame multiple exposure. Terrific way to increase or uh, make motion where you maybe don't have that ND filter. This is a 10 shot ND or multiple exposure, excuse me, in a train station. Um, if you wanna convey your mission as a photographer is, I really wanna show how busy this train station is well, okay, I'm going to try multiple exposure. Everybody renders slightly different through frame after frame, and the overall effect is this kind of pandemonium chaos. So it's a great technique for that. This is one of my favorite multiple exposures ever. This is this really moody, fine art type scene in Iceland, and there was a couple that obviously was taking it in. It was a very quiet moment for them. I mean, I definitely felt like I was going to intrude if I went any closer. So I set up on a tripod and I did multiple exposures. They did the selfie, exposure number one. Exposure number two and number three are where they were together and just slightly moving as they review the selfie. Mm -hmm. I love this shot about this. They kind of ghost. They're that 30% opacity when they're out on the left and right side, but then they come together and it just gives a little kind of otherworldly feel to the scene behind them. So Every remember that goes by my toe turns. Multiple exposures um, are, are going to help you guys. This is three frames, each a second long, stretching out cumulus clouds. Um, same idea here. Multiple exposures, stretching out clouds over in Prague. So don't think of multiple exposures as a gimmick, but maybe something you guys can use. Here's another example. Um, 
spinning the camera, twirling it over 10 frames, creating these kaleidoscopic effects, double exposure portraits. Here's my cowboy portrait. So we took a shot of me and then we did a second picture of a flag and then they were superimposed in the camera. The camera does all the math, by the way. They just come together, really fun. Or maybe your dog loves dog biscuits. So that we have a pointer, a German short hair pointer. The thing is so high energy. It, all it does is eat and run. Um, so we laid out all these dog bones on a white seamless, took a picture of that, then we spun the camera to the right. Here she is, she had a little small, soft box on her, shot a second frame, put it one on top of the other. You guys get the idea. So another homework, check out, explore multiple exposure with your camera, see what it can do, what it can't do. It's one area that almost every camera is working on right now. Sony, Fuji, Nikon, Canon, they're all doing new things with multiple exposure. So it may be time to revisit that. Um, let's talk background, number 12. We always talk about subjects. Yeah, well, what was the subject? I always say, well, what was the background? It's like, what do you mean? The, what I mean is the background is so key for so much. And I know this sounds very obvious, but it's not. Um, I think similar to lighting, background makes or breaks a photo. It really does. I mean, you can have the best subject ever, but if the background isn't working, I'm gonna look at that in a portfolio. An editor or a judge in a photo contest is gonna be say, nice subject, terrible background. Mm, sorry, you're close, but not quite there. So think about, it. so you're gonna think literally where the objects are in the background. That, that makes sense. That's how I normally would think of it, but it's also how you're going to render it. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. Here's just a really simple example. We were on the, an assignment in Alaska for a tourism bureau and this loon came up to our canoe. We're photographing canoeing and cabins on this lake, kind of come to Alaska, you know, that whole idea. And this loon just came over to our boat like it wanted to get in, I, it was crazy. And so this is the first shot, but as it went around the canoe and the light hit the water differently, every time the background changed. I, I, the first shot I was super excited about, but then the second one I liked, and then the third one was even better. And it wasn't any, the subject stayed the same. It was all background. So she, pan and blurs, a successful pan and blur, sure there's that technique, but equally as important as the subject is the background. When I am looking for a pan and blur or we're assigned to shoot pan and blur on a travel assignment, we will scope out the background and then figure out the subject to go through it. Literally, we flip it. It's not about the subject. First, it's about the background. And then let's try to find the subject to go in front of that because it's, that's going to be so important to bringing that shot together. Well, there's also how do you address the background? You guys all know depth of field, F16, everything sharp, F28. It's just a very narrow plane of focus. But that really can change the feel and effect of a photograph. F16, Heather and Scotland. Yep, everything's sharp, looks good. F4, very different look, very different mood. Now the eye is trying to figure out what's going on. You can kind of see hikers, but not really. It's almost dreamy like there. That's just a simple shift in depth of field and how you render the background. So don't always think necessarily what the subject is in the background, like behind your subject, but also how you're going to render it. Very important stuff. Certainly long lens wildlife shooters love to shoot with that shallow depth of field. Maybe it's on the front and not necessarily in the back. And other times you're gonna go for F16, get the whole thing tack sharp, right? That's your mission. Um, I threw this in here. How many people use focus peaking? If you are a mirrorless camera shooting, we hear this question a lot. I threw this in at the last minute. I'm sure a lot of you guys have, have probably tackled this or maybe you have this wired, but where in the heck do you focus in a scene to get everything tack sharp. You, you, everyone says a third into the shot. That's, that's kind of a good rule of thumb, but it is gonna vary really depending on your perspective, your focal length. There's a lot going on there. So that, that certainly presents the idea of focusing a little further into the shot. That's good. But then there's some variance there. If you ask me this question, if I'm using a mirrorless uh, camera, like for instance, Nikon, I can hit one button and turn on focus peaking and I can see red is the color that has been tagged for focus peaking. And if you don't know what focus peaking is, it's a mirrorless thing, although not, we have it on DSLRs too, the D850 has it, but it turns color of everything that's tack sharp. So you hit this button at F16 and you can see if that red, that rock below you in your shot, 
is red, then you know it's tack sharp. It's like using the depth of field preview button. We all remember that. The viewfinder got dark, you waited a second, and then you could kind of see in real time what was sharp. Well, that's all that focus peaking is, but it's the new way to do it. And mirrorless is so often what we're associating with that, but it's worth knowing. It's gonna help you decide where in the heck you wanna focus in your frame. I still use depth of field preview on our D850s in here, and certainly we'll shoot photos once in a while and just quickly preview on the LCD and see, see what it looks like. Now, you guys have probably heard the term bokeh, bokeh, you'll hear it pronounced a number of ways. Um, it's, it's an ongoing joke amongst, go to a bar, ask for photographers how to say B-O-K-E-H, bokeh, bokaka, bokeh, we won't go there. I just call it bokeh, keep it simple. It's the quality of the out of focus background elements. Not all lenses are equal. It relates to focal length and how wide open your f-stop is. This is a 600 f4. So it does a terrific job of making that background fully just soften out, but you don't always want that all the time. Maybe you want to hold on to a sense of place like where this monk might live. So uh, bokeh is important. It's worth um, exploring some of this because it really, you know, that quality, we use it all the time in portraiture. All right, last couple. Perspective is your friend. I love perspective as a photographer. You too should. It's the easiest way to put your mark on a photo. I'm going to get down low. I'm going to lean against a tree. I'm going to shoot through um, underneath some chairs. Um, it's your way to bring a unique spin to your photo. Um, try to avoid just walking up, putting the tripod down. I mean, I do that. I'm not saying that's bad. Um, tripods for me are a love-hate thing. I mean, I love the quality and things I can do on a tripod like slow exposures. But on the other hand, there's this journalism side of me that says, throw it away, let me get around and move and be free. So you got to find that happy medium there. Um, Here's what people, I think, forget about perspectives. Seasoned photographers, right? Remember, perspective does a lot. It, we think of it as angle of view, how you're seeing the world. Very true. But remember, how close or far away you are from subject matter really is using perspective in a very different way. It's not so much how you see the world. It's how you represent it in your photograph. Let me show you an example. Oh, this, I love this picture, it's so funny. Scotland, we have these yellow flowers and without scripting this at all, we had three people on this trip, one standing, one's kneeling and one's like, it's kind of like that t-shirt, like Darwinism, you know, if you've ever seen that t-shirt where it kind of goes from ape to human or, you know, there's all, all sorts of different spins on that whole idea. <laughs> this was like, oh, here it is. This is the evolution of photographers. They're, they're tall, they're getting shorter. Now they're lying right down front and center. So what, do, what am I talking about how you represent subjects? Well, take a look at this. Highland cattle, this is the 50 millimeter shot. It's true to life, yep. But these cattle are so funny. If I wanna bring emotion to my picture, I'm gonna put a wide angle lens on and get really close. Yes, this cow's head is enormous. That's what I'm trying to do via perspective. I'm trying to get a response from you guys. If I shoot this with a 50, Everything is true to life, but is that a good photograph? Well, it may be more realistic, but that's the beauty of photography. I, I have a creative license here to go any direction I want. So remember, get close with the wide angle, things get bigger, get further away, things. I, I think that we all know that, but we don't always use that. So here's a different idea. How about I lie in the ground, back away and shoot up? Now I'm, I'm very insignificant and this cow is you know looking down at me, it's a more sense of place, it kind of has this sense of power. So you guys get the idea. Get down low, you've all heard that one. It brings you eye to eye with the subject matter if it's a small animal or a big animal that happens to be lying down. And then remember, you have a shot like this. This is the snapshot. Step out of the car in Route 66, this is what you see. It's never gonna make the final cut, right? You're gonna throw this one out, but you know that you can use perspective, get in close to the grill. What are you photographing? This is about vintage Americana, cars, gas stations, pumps, old homes. So you gotta find those elements and get a fresh perspective, make the viewer engage. Get underneath the roof of the gas station if that's where the dynamic qualities of it are. So aerials, 
I will, you guys all get it. Um, maybe some of you fly drones. We love to get up in airplanes and helicopters on assignments and workshops. We constantly are trying to <laughs> beg a pot. We, every Badlands trip we do, we fly um, in these helicopters over Badlands. It is so much fun. It's a different perspective. It's, it's a fresh way to see the world. And when you're at Wall Drug and you want to make that donut look like it is the biggest, best donut you've ever eaten, you're going to get close with the wide angle. It doesn't have to be about reality. It's about perspective. Um, tension, last couple here. Um, when I say tension, what I'm referring to is engaging the viewer's eye. It's not necessarily making somebody have anxiety. It's you want people to be drawn into your photographs. You want them to move through the shot. Tension will accomplish that. A bear looking towards you off to the side, you're gonna to go to the bear, you're gonna to go to the right. There's tension here. Partly it's the subject matter, but there's also implied line at work here. Tension, where does the eye go here? It follows what's in focus, this ridge line. And just as a bonus, you get a sheep that's, that's you know in the middle of jumping down it. Tension coming down the, the lines of the fog, in this case, the tree trunk, the sun star, a very bright anchoring point of the shot. So you're doing something different. You're just creating tension. Same idea here. One cloud made the photo. Without this cloud, there's no tension. So not where we want to go. OK, and so I know we're running late here. I don't know how far you guys could go with this. Another great trick, by the way, to add tension. This is redwoods. This is right out of the camera. If you want to make it have tension, put a person in it. Um, add that now there's some scale and perspective, and now the eye is engaged. They look up, they see how big the forest is. You're creating a photograph. How big is that sand dune? No one knows. Wait till the people walk up there. Then you'll add tension. You'll engage the viewer. Salt flats down in Peru. How big is this? No one knows. Put people in there. So that just people is by way as one example. All right, so the final thing I have for you guys tonight, have that personal, COVID's a great time for this. What is that personal project? Birds are one that's been a 30 year project for me. I love bird photography, along with, as you probably figured out, a lot of different things. Um, but uh, you know, it's, there's no expectations. It doesn't matter if it works or not. I promise you will develop creatively. I, I can't say enough how important a personal project is. It, and, and I'm not saying this like it has to be some exotic thing. My personal project during COVID, ready for this? Macro. You know, I always shoot the random aspen leaf and the cool lichen. I have months at home. What am I going to do? Hey, you know that egg whisk? That's looking a little interesting. I'm going to try that as macro. It's like, you got to be kidding. This can only be a COVID moment. He's getting the egg beater out and doing a macro shot of it. Why not? Who cares? You're going to learn something. Um, lighting, ongoing, how to transform a landscape in five seconds from this to this using one speed light. The power of lighting. Remember, that's one of those parts of photography. All photography hinges on lighting. So that's an ongoing project for me. Speed lights, lighting, all sorts of. And then here's a few macro shots. I had to come up with a smiley topic for COVID. So shooting water droplets, using Winex. Have you guys ever, you have these uh, waxing agents. There's a bunch of them that you can buy in the market that'll make water bead. And then you put an interesting color underneath it. In this case, little stickers of smiley faces. That's what you get. So, and one other personal project for us just to end the show tonight. If you really want to know what Korea and I do all the time, this is a typical day at the Bull household. We are going to experiment with light. We have an assignment. We have these new lights. This is our personal project, but it's turning into this commercial gig. These lights could shoot 20 flashes in one second. As fast as your camera can shoot 20 frames a second, this flash can match that. So that presents some pretty cool stuff. You could photograph water approaching a model. So we had to figure out how to get water on the model. Cree's always on board for anything, climbs up on the roof. No problem, I got this. I'll stand on the roof with the hose and I'll spray the model. But now here's the only issue. The model is this guy. Now you guys gotta get this. We live in suburbia, just saying. We met more housewives than I ever knew were in our subdivision because all they do is they turn the corner with their kids coming home from school and they see this guy and my wife on the roof with the hose spraying him down. They're like, oh my God, it's a porn flick in, in the suburb. No, 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 closer on. Um, anyway, you guys get the idea. 
Um, so <clears throat> thanks a ton for having me, you guys. I, I hope I gave you a, a few ideas to maybe take with your own photography. Um, this is us. If you're interested in learning more, um, you can Google my name. You can find, we have our workshops. Um, we're on Facebook, Cree Manches, our Facebook um, presence. Let me show you this. If you guys are at all interested, we have, it's kind of an invite only, but you'll get in. Um, Cree will manage that. But we have a Facebook group called Photos for Inspiration TVPW, Tom Bull Photo Workshops. But if you type that in the search window in Facebook, this is a closed group, but it's really just a collaborative group of like-minded photographers sharing work and offering feedback. It's pretty cool. And most of these folks have been on our online uh, trips. So if you're looking for another place to present your work, um, consider that. So thank you so much. I will be quiet. I'm going to roll it back over to Donna here. Okay, Tom, I, there's one thank thing. You, Tom. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, in incredible photography. Jeez, <laughs> very beautiful. Thank but, you. Um, one uh, comment here from Charles. He said, do you know a Colorado photographer, J.R. Snelzer? I yeah. Think, okay, and he says, oh, yeah. I think he lives in Millican. He used to live in Columbus and attended OSU. Yeah, no. Screen. All right, let me, uh, let me get out of the square scene here and let me hold on here a second. Let me do this, stop share. Let me get back to you guys. Yeah, JR, I, I know JR, I, I've done presentations with him. He used to run P, the photo, I think the Photographic Society of America is what he was most associated with. So I met him through that, but definitely know him and he's here in town. Anybody have any questions? I think I probably wore everybody out. I, was, I didn't know what my timeline was. So I'm just like, I'm going to let it rip here. So and guys, if you have something, make sure to unmute yourself if you need to make a comment or would like to make a comment because everybody's muted. So excellent okay. presentation, Tom. We appreciate it and uh, certainly gave us some ideas. Um, like using the high ISOs, which we're not supposed to use, right? <laughs> right. About it's, a great, it's a great idea to try it out. Why not? It's there, right? Yeah, I mean, that's that's what it is. I mean, we, you know, we all get, you know, it's funny because I, I do a lot of stories for the photo magazines and, and teach for Kelby and all this. And I think part of the fun for me is kind of going in and just stirring the pot a little bit because we know what's supposedly right, but it mm -hmm. almost begs the question, well, who's tried it the other way? And, and maybe it is a disaster, but it, you know, it's, it's often led to some very interesting uh, revelations and different creative ideas. Um, I thought that was really a tremendous talk. I was really intrigued by your multiple exposure. I guess I never thought about that. That's something to try. Yeah, yeah you know, I, I cannot say enough. I mean, for the long, you guys remember back in the day of film, right, where you had to do the math and figure out the right exposure. So if it was three or four shots that it can, so cameras now do all that for us. And then they're giving us new ways to blend the images with different bias towards highlight or shadow. Um, you get to save the originals now. So you're not losing the, the raw files that go into them. It's, wow, it just it offers a lot. And I think so many of us have just kind of written it off, but you might be surprised. Oh, thank you for good ideas. I'm sorry, somebody was talking. Go ahead. Oh, I said thanks for all the good ideas. Hey. Tom, when you were doing the multiple exposures, were you using the multiple exposure in camera or were you taking several different images and then overlaying them and combining them? Which were you doing? Yeah, no, all in camera. Yeah, all oh, okay. right in that certainly image oh, overlay. Getting it to a certain number and then. Yeah, right okay. there, just right at that immediate. You know, the trickiest part about those portraits were we would have studio lights set up to shoot me as a cowboy, but then we'd have other studio lights set up on the flag six feet to the left. So it's literally like click, but it's a really thought out shot. And then it's, it would be hard to randomly just go down the street and find two things that seem but when you start to say okay that's okay i'm going to put these two shots together and a little more thought behind it it's it's pretty fun here's one for you guys that another photographer just told me about i'm dying to try this can you imagine this so this is just so perfect he's like hey have you ever done this he's like do your first shot as a black and white and your second shot as a color as a multiple exposure i'm like come on 
I mean, I got to get in the menu between shots. He's like, it works. And he's doing shots of eyeballs. So the iris is like blue, but then he has this black and white shot behind. It's like, it's one of those fine art shots where I'm just kind of like, cool, wow, far out. You know, those were really descriptive men. <laughs> but it was a great idea. I'm like, this is so great. Who would have thought of this stuff? Tom, I have a comment. Uh, in, in Ohio, in Cuyahoga National Forest, there's a waterfall. Now, the singer, Kenny Rogers, when he initially retired from singing, he went into photography and he went around the country and shot pictures. Well, he took a picture of this. A few years ago, I was at the waterfall and I took multiple exposure on a single frame, 10 shots of the same waterfall. And then I, I don't know why, but I grabbed the book of Kenny Rogers photos that I have and I leafed ah. through it. My shot was almost identical to his. Ah, Amazing. That cool. I love it. That's great. Anybody else? You know, I'll throw this out to you guys too. You can find, you know, Cree and I, we're here and I always tell every, every group this, um, you know, it, I, I feel like you guys have a ton of experience. <clears throat> so, you know, you're, you're probably like enough of this guy already, but if you ever have a question um, and we get this from people that we haven't seen in like years, just Tom, Tom Bowl photo. That's all, you, my email is super easy. And we get it all the time. Somebody's like, hey, did I see a shot from Alaska? Have you been there? I, I am more than happy to share whatever I know, whether it's details of a location, a recommendation on a piece of gear or a technique or whatever. I mean, I, I really love the collaborative feel of photography and, and I, I, I really truly feel like, you know, we, we learn from each other. You, just when you think you know a lot, you realize you don't know anything. And so if we can ever help, um, don't be a stranger. Um, let us know. We know Susie. Susie's going to be coming on here. Where's Roberta? She, her work will dazzle you guys. She is beautiful. Her portrait and cosplay is unbelievable. You'll be in for a, uh, it's a great show. I'm sure she'll have. did her cosplay presentation last year, last December, actually. She's going right. to do uh, landscapes and something else. All right. Yeah. Hey, Tom. Yeah. Is there a uh, is there a list of your fifteen tips? We could carry that along as a cheat sheet. Yeah, I could send I can send an email. I'll fire it over to I have Roberta's email. I know for sure. Um, yeah, I can I can I can condense that down. I don't have it right now. Um, it's in the keynote form. It'll take me two seconds though, so mm -hmm. I could do. Yeah, that. that would be great. Thanks. Hey, Mark. There's no cheating in photography. <laughs> <laughs> I cheat all the time. Sorry. <laughs> I will, I'm making a post-it here, so I'll make sure I get that out to you. Yeah, great presentation. Great. It did stir Thank up you. the pot. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, Thank you much. Thanks for having me, Thank you guys. You. Uh -huh. uh, don't, uh, don't forget, uh, Donna recorded this, so she's going to put it on YouTube and send out a link. Right, Donna? Oh, okay. That's right. If yeah. you see so you JR... If you see JR, tell him that Westbridge says hi. <laughs> okay, I'll write that down. Because, yeah, he's, he's around town. We haven't seen him recently, but we haven't been going out. So he's probably here in town as well. Okay, Thank you cool. So much, Tom. And Cree, if she's still here. You bet. Yeah, Thank yeah. you, Roberta, for putting us. Oh, this there you are. There <laughs> there Good night, everybody. Yeah. Good night. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. Kansas City is not going to win, so I'm on the Cleveland train here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, go Browns. All right. <laughs> so much. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. All Tom. right. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Donna, Good night. I'm going to be sending you an email requesting uh, Frank and Audrey Began's email address because I have a question for them on underwater photography. So I'll just send you the okay. question and then you can send me their email address. I will I will absolutely do that. Okay. Thank you very much. Right, sure. Good night, night, everyone. Good to see all of you.